Today we're speaking to Jeff Tooth, Australia's High Commissioner to Kenya. Hi Jeff. Now Jeff, you're an ambassador, a High Commissioner and a permanent representative. Why is that and how does it work? The reason behind it is that um, I'm High Commissioner to four countries, uh, that's uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda and Rwanda, and I'm ambassador to the three non-British Commonwealth countries in uh, South Sudan, Somalia and Burundi. South Sudan I'm the first Australian ambassador to actually because it's the world's newest country. But I'm also permanent representative to a number of UN agencies. Nairobi, where I'm based, is the um, fourth UN city after Vienna, Geneva, New York. And uh, there is located, located the United Nations Environment Program and the uh, UN Habitat as well as some very big UN agencies like um, WFP that's not the headquarters but because of their coverage they, they have a big involvement there. And it works um, because I'm, I've got some very hard working staff. <laughs> that's how we manage to do it. Uh, I have 74 very good Australians and Kenyans and uh, people from other countries in the region that allow us to, to work on Australia's interests with both those countries and those agencies. Um, there's also an advantage to it um, because the East African community nations, um, the five countries um, of uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Burundi and Rwanda are working to become a, a, a union. So it makes a lot of sense us covering those countries as well. So there's some advantages to it and it allows for a, a, a very interesting work environment. Australia first established diplomatic relations in East Africa 50 years ago, starting with Kenya and Tanzania. What are those relationships like now, 50 years later? Very good. We have, we have friendly relationships with all, all those countries, um, the, five, the five of the East African community, and South Sudan in particular because of the, the uh, very strong uh, diaspora community we have. Somalia, of course, being a failed state, it's a difficult, more difficult relationship to have. But, uh, but with the, with the other countries, very strong indeed. Um, we don't have the sort of enormously substantial interest that some countries have, including, of course, with Great Britain, because a lot of those are uh, former coloni colonies of Great Britain, or France, who's the, um, and some of the other colonial powers. But we're seen in a very positive light by these countries. They, we've had a lot of good, solid people-to-people -people links. Um, Australians do some wonderful things in these countries. Uh, in the NGO community, working for the United Nations as volunteers, um, and uh, we're good tourists as well. We're very keen to go to that place, and we've also got some new business links, which are building very strongly. Um, the education links are strong. Kenya is our second biggest education market, um, and we've in the recent years we've we've had a deliberate policy of re-engaging with Africa, and I don't think it's it's more obvious than in, in these countries that we're now really focused on, on Australia's interests there and their interests in Australia and uh, it's, it's going forward in a, a very positive way. Jeff, moving on now to the trade relationship between Australia and East Africa, what are the best prospects for improving those relationships? We're strongest in the mining sector across Africa. In fact, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very substantial investment and involvement now. We have at last estimate, 240 Australian mining countries, companies operating across Africa and some $50 billion of investment. And this is where we're really showing the way. The strength of the Australian economy has much to do, of course, with our mining sector. And we're now that's the, the cutting edge of our involvement in the business community in Africa. So, for example, in Kenya, there's now a very, uh, very positive uh, mining program, um, a mining company called Base Resources, which is developing what will a titanium mine which will double Kenya's mining income by itself. There's another company called Aviva Gold which is uh, very, making some very encouraging signs which in Kenya's mining industry hasn't gone very far over the last it's 50 years of, of um, nationhood. Tanzania is a different story. There are 26 Australian mining companies all, that are already there. So that's, that's on its way and is, there's growth potential everywhere in, in all the countries that we have in East Africa and it's something we're looking at closely in working in, in mining. But it, elsewhere there are, there are other op opportunities as well. It's green fields for Australia, but, but already there are Australian IT companies on the ground. Australian education providers are, are, are everywhere looking for, looking for good students, good quality students to come and work, um, study in Australia. So there are a, a lot of trade op opportunities there and as I mentioned earlier, agriculture is an area that we, we see also much more potential because of our skills, our capacity to sell um, some 
great technology. We're already heavily involved in the agricultural research, research institutes in, in Africa and I think that, that down the track we'll see a lot of opportunities for Australian agricultural companies. Of course, last year we saw terrible scenes when Africa experienced a shocking drought and a humanitarian crisis as a result of that. What did Australia do in that case to help and what are we doing to make sure that that situation doesn't happen again? Yeah, Australians should be very proud of what they did and what Australia did in response to that. It was one of the worst humanitarian disasters in history, impacting on 13 million people. Um, and Australia was one amongst the most generous countries in, in responding to it. A very large government contribution, but also enormous support from the Australian community. Um, fundraising events all over Australia and a really substantial contribution. So that helped ensure that, you know, that this crisis, which of course impacts the most vulnerable in, in the main, the, the poor, the children, the, the um, nomadic peoples of, of these areas, it, it particularly hit Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, South Sudan, those sort of countries which are already extremely marginal and vulnerable in the areas. So the Australian contribution in terms of immediate humanitarian assistance, we were one amongst the fastest to move as well. Then Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd made, an, made a visit to, to uh, Somalia and, and really worked, we worked very closely with uh, the WFP, UNHCR and other major donors and Australian NGOs to get on the ground. But this, while that immediate, the immediacy of the humanitarian crisis is over, there is always the potential for another one. There are a lot of solid indicators. Well, the next one could be even worse down the track. Uh, climate change is impacting on the region in a big way. Agriculture is becoming more and more marginal in some areas. Population growth is putting more and more pressure on the land and indigenous uh, nomadic ways of life are dying out. So. The Australian aid program and Australian experts, uh, agri agricultural experts and others are working on ways of developing resilience in these communities. And some very innovative ideas from stock insurance and other, and other programs are underway. And the Australian aid vote isn't just confi confined to the immediate humanitarian response, you know, providing food and water and so on to those in disaster situation. It's looking at ways to alleviate the disaster next time. And what this did show in areas where resilience work was done, um, whether by UNDP, including through Australian funding, the impact of the drought was far less. And so those lessons are going to help next time around, and Australia is going to be part of that. There's a steady flow of Australian tourists who visit East Africa and then African students that come to Australia. Are those numbers still increasing? Yeah, I think the strength of the Australian dollar, uh, Kenya is on everyone's bucket list to travel to, I think. Uh, I think The Age just had Kenya and Tanzania, the Serengeti and the, and the other areas as, as amongst the, the hottest places to have take, be a tourist nowadays. There's, and as I said, the strength of the Australian dollar means people have more money to go to those sort of places and there are more traffic routes opening up. Uh, we now have a code share between Qantas and Kenya Airways. So we, we are seeing a substantial increase in, in numbers traveling. The world's most traveled man last year ranked Kenya the number one country on the world to, the world to visit. Um, I think disappointing for us, yeah, I think he ranked Australia third, but I disagree, of course, about that. But uh, so we are seeing more and more Australians coming. Um, it's doing some interesting things too. It's not just uh, pure tourism. Of course, the safari parks of Kenya are world famous and world leading and extraordinary things to see there. The, the coastal districts are, are fabulous beaches and the like. But not as good as Australian beaches, but they're still great and there's a lot of history to see. But Australians are also getting involved in tourism, volunteer tourism and, and going to see um, it, development sites as well. And we have some Australians doing some extraordinary things in these countries. And one I can think of is a woman called Emma, who's uh, developed a school in Tanzania, in Arusha area in Tanzania. And Australians are coming there, staying out a couple of days before they climb Mount Kilimanjaro or visit the Serengeti. And, and experiencing what, what a, a, a Tanzanian student goes through and, the, and they're getting to visit the villager structures and seeing all that. And uh, they're becoming more engaged in, in development ac activities as a response. And that's just one part of, of you know, what we're seeing, a much more active tourism, a more socially aware tourism. And there are a lot of opportunities in, in the part of the world I cover. On the other side of things, we, there are Kenyan tourists coming to Australia as well. There's growing middle class in East Africa, which looking for 
tourism opportunities and we're of course encouraging them to come and spend their dollars in Australia. But also we have a, a very strong and long history of providing education to the to students in, in East Africa, particularly Kenya, which is our number two market for students in 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 Africa. They um I th they find Australian academic institutions not only very good in providing them a, a very practical and focused education, but they find the Australian way of life and attitude to life much closer to Africa than I think they um, they find some of our competitors. I think they like the weather more as well too, and all those sort of things. Uh, it, it helps us. The Australian dollar has a reverse effect, impact, of course, on that on that in that way. You know why it helps Australian tourists afford to come to Africa. It doesn't really help Australian African students come to Australia, but they're still coming. They recognise just how good Australia's education is and the opportunities it provides and they're, they're still coming and there's still a lot of interest. We mentioned earlier that you're accredited to a number of countries in East Africa and of course two of them, South Sudan and Somalia, have fairly difficult security situations. What can Australia do there to help? Yeah, South Sudan and Somalia are in serious security, have serious security issues. They both feature very prominently on the UN Security Council agendas and uh, um, there is constant talk. And there's, there's a lot of grounds for optimism though, but uh, we, Australia can have a very positive role in, in both countries and we've already done quite a lot. We support um, the African Union's involvement in S Somalia, for example. We have Australian troops on the ground in South Sudan in peacekeeping roles and Australian Federal Police. Um, they're doing important jobs there um, and we have been involved in Sudan and South Sudan for some time at that level. Um, we will continue to look for oppor opportunities to do that. I mentioned earlier the South Sudanese diaspora in Australia. 30,000 South Sudanese, up to 30,000 South Sudanese in Australia came here as part of the re our refugee program, going back to, to get to be involved in the, new, the world's newest state and help it establish its uh, statehood. Um, these are these are important players and people we can work with. Uh, we will work with uh, the international community. Look for more opportunities. We we are becoming more engaged in some of the some of the uh, institutions that are are working on on Somalia and South Sudan. Our aid vote is on the increase and in allowing us more latitude to do to do programs and projects in both countries. You mentioned the high number of tourists from Australia that travel to East Africa. Do you have any advice for them before they leave? Well, they should definitely register, insure and subscribe. And to register, that means register with the smarttraveller.gov.au, which ensures that your records, your travel records, your address, your contact details are available to the, to the Australian High Commission in Nairobi if, if something goes wrong and we can help you um, insure, just to make sure that you have travel insurance, always vital. Um, no matter where you're travelling in the world, in Africa, the, the, you know, things can go wrong. You can lose, you can lose things. You can get need hospital care. It, those things can lead to e extraordinary costs if you don't, if you aren't insured. You, you may need to be medevaced. These, that is a, a major hit to your, to your, your travel budget if if you don't, if you're not insured, and um, and subscribe, and that means subscribe to travel updates so that we, we can we can send to you an update on if something if something goes wrong. 99.99% of the time, nothing will go wrong. You'll have the most fabulous time, amazing memories. But in that that little percentage of time that something can go wrong, you know, the best thing is to do is be prepared and be prepared by uh, by do, uh, registering, insuring, and subscribing. Very smart move. And secondly, we can we can also use that um, uh, that information that we get to give, tell you about important events like Anzac Day. We hope there are. Is a major Anzac Day ceremony in Nairobi, for example, but also all across East Africa. And if you're travelling around that time, a very moving Australian event to participate in. We put it on our website as well, and so I encourage you to all look at our website, Australians to look at our website when, when travelling as well. But most of all, have a great time. It's the best advice. And just finally, what words would you use to encapsulate Australia's relationship with the countries of East Africa? Friendly and with great potential. Thanks very much for that, Jeff. Thank you. And that was Jeff Tooth, Australia's High Commissioner to Kenya.